Hello, everyone. Hi. I'm Michelle Hines. I'm the executive director of Inside Out Reentry Community. It is my great pleasure to welcome you tonight to Homecoming Reentry Summit. We are so fortunate to have so many people here in attendance. We are very grateful to the City of Iowa City's Human Rights Commission for their sponsorship through the Social Justice and Racial Equity Grant. I'd also like to thank the University of Iowa College of Law and the University of Iowa Liberal Arts Beyond Bars program. It's homecoming week for the University of Iowa, which means for many parades, parties, having a good time. But for the 5,000 Iowans leaving incarceration each year, homecoming means something different. Feelings of excitement, fear, stress, thoughts of family, friends, flood minds. Individuals could be starting over with everything lined up or nothing. Where will I live? Where will I work? Will I see my kids? Will I make it this time? Are some of the questions that many of them will ask. At Inside Out Reentry, we support individuals by helping them answer those questions. We provide a safe and non judgmental environment for returning citizens to get support. We assist individuals find housing, employment, access mental health or substance abuse resources, get a library card, whatever an individual may need to live a full and happy life in our community. We help individuals apply to get their voting rights restored, help them access education, and find camaraderie in the inside out community. After a year of concentrated effort, we helped a young man in our community receive his high school diploma through weekly tutoring sessions. When asked why he wanted to get his diploma over the GED, he said, they already have so many things to judge me against with my criminal background. I wanted to prove them wrong that I could get my diploma. And that's why we do the work that we do. The benefits of him receiving his diploma will continue for him on in his future. Community reentry supports is really important. This evening and tomorrow, we will hear from formerly incarcerated individuals, activists, attorneys, social service providers, spiritual leaders that are all dedicated to criminal justice reform and reentry work. We'll hear personal stories, statistics, challenges, and successes. And if you have not yet registered for tomorrow's events, we'd welcome your attendance. As we move through these events, I ask you to think deeply about these following questions. Are we a society that truly believes in second chances? Or are we a society that punishes individuals based on their past and not their present? What can we do as a community to be more supportive? Tonight we'll hear from the director of the Iowa Department of Corrections and a national leader in higher education and prison. We'll also dive deeply into the important topic of felony disenfranchisement in Iowa. As you engage with these panels and presentations, I hope you are moved to get involved. Our government and society is in, in general is starting to understand how mass incarceration is unsustainable. The First Step Act released 3,100 federal inmates back into the community this past June. If policies continue to change, we will see more of the two million plus individuals that are currently incarcerated return to their communities. And what kind of community do we want to be for them? I hope we will all leave these events with additional knowledge, a better understanding, as well as an urgency and direction to pursue change. We'd like to thank you for your participation. So I'm excited to introduce our first speaker. Uh, I first met uh, Director Beth Skinner two years ago when I was a graduate student taking her social work in the criminal justice system course at the University of Iowa. And I was very excited when she was named the director of the Iowa Department of Corrections this past June. Uh, director Skinner started her career in community supervision. She's worked as a residential officer, a certified Iowa peace officer on the high risk unit and supervisor. She's also worked in the Council of State Government's Justice Center where she had the opportunity to work with the White House, Department of Justice, corrections administrators, policymakers, and researchers across the country on the best strategies to reduce recidivism. 
Help me welcome to the stage, Beth Skinner. Well, good evening. I'm going to take this right off. Is this okay if I just pop this thing right off? This is going to go against all the video stuff. You guys are going to hate me for this. Anyway, uh, I have to be able to turn because I have a PowerPoint presentation. I was going to kind of fly by the seat of my pants, but all my colleagues said, don't do it. And I'm like, okay, so I'll go ahead. and Because I have some stats I want to share with you all. But first of all, thank you very much, Michelle, and thank you for all the work that you guys are doing around reentry. Um, as you know, and I'll be talking about here this evening, is how critically important the reentry process is. Um, and so I'm going to share some. So I'm going to share some kind of bad news with you, but some really good news. So we're going to end on a good note, I promise. But I have one question before I start. And I'm, if people know me, I'm pretty informal. Um, so I kind of like. And if people have questions, you guys can stop and ask me at any point in time. But I'm probably going to take 20 minutes. I promise, maybe 30. We'll, we'll see how it goes. Um, but um, first of all, I got to find out. Where are my students in my class? Are they here? Oh, look, they're in the front row. They had a midterm exam today. So I, we uh, bumped up their test for them. So hi, guys. How you doing? Excellent. Thank you. Awesome. Just embarrassed them. So anyway, um, I'm Beth Skinner, and um, I am a social worker, and I'm proud to be a social worker. Um, and uh, I've been in this position for about five months. And we are off to the races. Uh, the good news is uh, we are in such a great position this year because we have a governor that really supports criminal justice reform and gets our work. Um, this is the first time that I can remember working in corrections that we kind of we're kind of like uh, you know on all cylinders. We have support that at the highest level of state government. Um, I support treatment and reentry. Uh, my staff does my administration. We get the work, so I think we're we're going to see some good changes in the next few years. So I'm very excited for that. So. I just want to give you a little background what Iowa Corrections really is first, so you can kind of get an idea. This is probably not very easy to see for you in the back row. Uh, so these are correctional institutions. So we have nine prisons. We have max, medium, and minimum, which are the ones that are, are releasing prisons. So we have nine across the state, and then we have eight judicial districts. When I say judicial districts, that's probation, parole, and work release. So we have eight of those across the state. So those are on community-based supervision. They, they can land in any of those eight judicial districts. We are in the sixth district, in case you didn't know that. OK, so I, kinda wanna st I always kind of start my presentations with that statement of the problem. And hopefully, I won't yank this with me when I go. So um, I'll try to be careful. But I just want to share some national stats with you all. And then I'll talk about specific Iowa stats. But what we know is about 1 in 33 uh, adults are under some type of correctional control. So if you think about this room, one in 33 are under some type of correctional control. Um, this is kind of the, uh, the sad news here, is that about, uh, first of all, we know 97% of the people are coming out. In Iowa, that's about 93%. So of the 8,500 some people we have in our prisons now, we know about 93% of them are going to come out into the, into the community. That's why reentry is so critically important to our work. Um, we know, this is, and this is national data, 68% of state prisoners are rearrested in three years. That goes up to 75% at five years. Is that an issue? That's very concerning. Rearrested because they reoffended or because they broke the law? Rearrested. Yep. And then 50% of state prisoners are reincarcerated within three years. And that could be for a technical revocation or for a new crime. So the stats. Um, are pretty, I think, um, horrifying. Thank you. Yeah, they're horrifying. We have a lot of work to do. So I want to talk about this, the impact, the overall the impact on the criminal justice system. Um, and what we know is that we spend a significant amount of money on criminal justice, about $52 billion a year. Um, that's a lot of uh, taxpayer dollars. We know that we have sig significant public safety concerns. We know that um, people are rearrested at a very high rate when they, are, when they uh, re enter back into the community. Um, some of these people that are under our supervision have serious chronic health issues, not just mental health is issues, but physical health issues. Uh, we know that um, we have a rising prison popula population. We have been relatively stable in Iowa for some time now, uh, but we're over capacity. Uh, we're about 21% over capacity. We also know, which is no news to those of you that are really committed to reentry, is that you know people with criminal records face significant barriers. Um, you can see here uh, they have behavior health issues, and I'm going to share some stats with you here uh, this evening. Um, significant reductions, even trying to get a job, let alone have a livable wage, is a challenge for these individuals. Um, renters 
if you can't find a place to live because they have a criminal record, no one wants to hire someone, or no one wants to rent someone that has a criminal background. Um, and one thing I think is a really interesting piece of information is that there's an estimated 40,000 collateral consequences on the books for those that have a criminal record. 40,000. First of all, I want to know who had time to count that many, because that's a lot. That is that's a lot in terms of the kind of consequences. Um, I would also recommend, if you are into, um, you know, understand more about, you know, the effects of criminal records and things like that, MythBusters um, that actually the uh, Department of Justice puts out, like on housing, uh, employment. There's some great uh, stuff on reentry that kind of like it's like a MythBuster, like you can't, you know, you can't get certain kind of. Um, uh, benefits and things like that. But it's very informative for people that are working in the reentry field to know and educate people. So it, tells, it talks about all those myths. Um, let me go to the next slide. So again, the barriers and challenges uh, we'll talk about a little bit. Um, you know, there's a lot of work to be done in reentry, and I think a lot of the work that you guys are doing now is excellent. It's changing people's perception of people that have criminal backgrounds or that come back into their communities. It's changing the public's perception of these individuals that are coming back into their communities because we know that 93% of them are coming back. And these are human beings. And when you mentioned second chances, I'm a, big, I'm a big believer that everyone deserves second chances and that people can change and that we want to give these individuals an opportunity to come back into their communities and be successful. And I, and I mean that. Um, we also know that there's you know, challenges to, access, to um, accessing housing and employment. Um, you know, we're trying to, in our prisons now, we're trying to really build treatment capacity. We don't want to warehouse people. We want to, get, we want to address the need that brought them to us in the first place. A lot of those are mental health issues, a lot of trauma, um, a lot of, you know, our antisocial uh, attitudes, values, beliefs, uh, substance abuse issues, things like that. Go ahead. Um, but we know that people are at risk at early, for early failure. Uh, this is probably no shock to anyone here. Uh, this is a stat from Urban. It says 50% of all offenders who fail do so in the first three to six months. Does that give you an, I mean, a reason why reentry is so critically important? Okay. And usually the trigger of early failure is substance abuse. I can tell you that the number one condition that gets, of supervision that gets violated the most is what? Substance abuse. And do we expect people to relapse? Yes, we expect people to relapse. So we have to be, we have to think differently about people that have substance abuse issues. Go ahead. Is that substance abuse or substance abuse? Abuse, Abu abuse. Yeah, so we have to think differently about people who are gonna relapse. So instead of pulling the plug on them, we should be getting them treatment, get them connected to resources because that's a part of that continuum when people have relapse and that's to be expected. Go to the next slide. So here's some, some, just some stats on just Iowa prisons. We have about 8,459 incarcerated across our nine institutions. On community supervision, we have about 38,257. That includes um, probation, parole, work release, and pretrial release. Go to the next one. Um, this is one of our challenging trends I want to share with you is, is recidivism. So how many know what recidivism means? OK, wow. This is a very well-schooled group here. So for those that you don't that don't know, it's basically it's a three we follow people out for three years. So when they leave prison, we follow them out three years. And if they come back into prison within those three years for uh, a new conviction or technical revocation, that counts as recidivism. So just so everyone's on the same page. So unfortunately in the last four years recidivism has only gone up for us. Um, it's gone up um, since it was 31.9% in 2015. Uh, and, and our recent stats is 38.8%. Now, I can talk to you all day why I think this number is, but to me, this number is unacceptable. Um, we need to be um, making, we need to make our, our communities safer. We need to be treating people. Um, but the, there's a, one kind of positive signal here in terms of the, when you see the recidivism is that between FY17 and 18, it went up 2.4%. In between 19, 18 and 19, it went up 1%. So we're seeing it slow in terms of the, how fast it was moving up. It's starting to slow down. So my hope is in the next year or two, we're going to see, see that reverse trend, and we're going to see it decrease over time. Um, another thing that's a challenging trend is um, who is coming to our prisons. Um, we are seeing a lot. You know, we, we talk a lot about op opioids, and that is an issue. But for those that come into our prison with drug-related uh, charges, opioids is probably like 3% or less. 
The big one that's coming back is meth. Probably no surprise to this group whatsoever. Meth, marijuana, and uh, cocaine. But marijuana is definitely, or I'm uh, sorry, meth is really on the rise for our admissions to prisons. Next one. Another challenging trend, I promise that we're gonna flip the script in a second and talk about positive things, but I just wanna give you guys kind of the statement of the problem is that we have about, of everyone that's incarcerated across the nine institutions, 63% have some type of mental health issue. Okay, is that surprising to anyone? Okay. And what we know is that people with mental health issues stay a little longer in comparison to those that don't have a mental health issue. And we know, recidivism-wise, that if you can see on the, the right side there, is that those with a mental health issue, their recidivism is 66.5%. To me, that's troubling and concerning, uh, and this is no. What, we, what we're seeing in Iowa, we're also seeing nationally as well. A trend why people are recycled back in, and I can talk about that for like a whole workshop. Why people with mental illness have a higher rate of return, um, we, but that's we can't do that tonight because Michelle will kick me or off the stage. Um, but it's uh, definitely a concern for the Department of Corrections. Next slide. Again, um, just talking about women in general. We know a lot of women in our prisons have a lot of trauma issues. We also know that about 86% of the women in our prisons have some type of mental health issue. Okay, next slide. And then the other challenging trend we're, that um, no news to you uh, and, and is consistent with Urban found is that people are really are most likely going to fail in the first three to 18 months. Um, that's when it's, it's the critical, critical time to get the wraparound services to make sure these individuals don't fall through the cracks because this is what I call survival time, and you can see the numbers there. The uh, maroon bar, the purple, and the, and the yellow is that these people are, if they're gonna, if they're gonna really come back to prison, they're gonna, they're gonna, it's gonna happen in those first 18 months. So that's why services, family, community is so important, that first three to 18 months to get people stabilized. Next one. All right, turn to the positive. All right, so the positive things that we're doing is we are using you know, risk assessment to identify the reasons why people are coming into our system. Okay, there's validated actuarial risk assessments that we use, and we identify those needs and we treat them with programming. Um, so we have uh, evidence-based programming in the Iowa Department of Corrections that addresses that reason why someone comes into our system. Um, we also are doing a lot of work around fidelity, which is continuous quality improvement, because we wanna make sure the things that we are doing are done with fidelity and done well. Next slide. Um, in terms of our evidence-based programs, about 87% of our programs that we offer in the prisons are evidence-based, which means they reduce risk. Uh, we, you know, we like to get that higher, of course, but we wanna make sure the resources that we are using in, the, in corrections are going to make a difference for these people when they get out. Bottom line. Next slide. Um, these are some of the programs that we offer. If, if any of you, are, maybe so many of you are maybe familiar with them. Uh, we have moral recognition therapy that uh, Warden McKinney's back there. He's a big proponent of, um, he's, he's the warden of IMCC. Uh, he's actually where we started at MRT. Uh, it's been a huge success and it's, what, it's an evidence-based practice that we're using. Uh, we started IMCC, now we are um, using it in many of our prisons now. We have, we're using, <coughs> excuse me, the Good Lives model, which is a sex offender programming. We're using active, um, and we're using thinking for a change, seeking safety, and cognitive behavioral interventions for substance abuse. So again, our menu of, of, of programs are gonna be evidence-based that are gonna tackle the specific issues that brought someone to begin with us, to, brought us to, to us to begin with. Next slide. Um, so we're talking about release goals. Um, this, is, this is kind of, the, I think, the meat and potatoes of the presentation. So, um, and this is all, I think, probably what all you care about probably the most in terms of, you know, what do we do? How do we plan for release? Um, the goal is obviously to reduce risk uh, of those people are, that are coming in. Uh, we want them to have at least six months left on supervision, making sure that, we know that employment is a key piece. Um, we, you know, getting people jobs even before they are released. Uh, we know that education and we know that employment are pathways to desistance and mitigates risk. Uh, we know we have to have safe and stable housing, a lot of the work that you guys do. Critically important, how can you re-enter and how can you be successful if you don't have a roof over your head? Or how can you even go get a job if you don't have a roof over your head? Uh, it just, it's, it's setting up for failure. Uh, making sure that we're, we're reuniting uh, pro-social family, family members, um, friends, and things like that. Um, that's a really key piece. That builds protective factors. When we say protective factors, we say that mitigates risk. 
So when you have pro-social individuals surrounding you, um, it's, it's a good thing, so it actually mitigates risk. Um, making sure treatment appointments are scheduled ahead of time before people even leave prison. I think that's a really important thing as well. Um, I think what happens a lot of times, people drop through the cracks because they leave prison and they don't have their next mental health appointment scheduled, and then they, can't, they call and they can't get in for 90 days. And so they run out of their medication or they go back, they relapse, and they don't get treatment and things like that. So we need to make sure that there's not that fragmentation, that there's a continuum of care when people leave prison, when they come out into their communities. And then, of course, aftercare and a discharge plan. Next slide. Um, this is a key piece, and this is why we, we love your organization, is that we cannot operate in a vacuum in corrections. I mean, this is some, we can't be all to everyone. We have to rely on our partners in the community to catch a lot of these people that are coming out and provide services. Uh, so it, we really value collaborations from the state, local, and nonprofit agencies are absolutely key for these individuals to be connected to, um, to help get their GED or to help them get post-secondary education or help them get their driver's license. You know, these, you guys play a major role in ensuring these people can get to, you know, get the things that they need when they get out. Because we, again, we know that the most critical time is at three to 18 months. Um, awesome, uh, you can go to the next slide. Um, one thing too is, is building that human and social capital, which is extremely important. Uh, making sure that we're giving people opportunities to, to get education. Uh, we're doing a lot of work around post-secondary education, uh, as well as um, apprenticeship programs is something we're really investing in. Um, we're working with, again, can't do this in a vacuum, working with NAMI, we're working with Iowa Workforce Development, we're working with the DOT to figure out how we can get people their license and ID before they even leave the prison. We have job developers that are in the prison, we want to get more of those so we can have more bridges to jobs when people get out. You know, we're working with employers on a regular basis. We have a great relationship at our Mount Pleasant prison where um, individuals are getting hired before they even get out the door. Um, so we're just trying to, you know, leverage those resources because what we know is that we cannot do it alone, okay? And one other thing, too, is, oh, you're fine, um, is we have these reentry roundtables. We're starting November 6th with the governor. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to invite employers to our prisons to talk about the benefits of hiring someone with a criminal record and educating them because there's a lot of stigma that's attached to that. So we're trying to get more and more employers uh, involved and educated so we can get more opportunities for these individuals when they come out, which is really critical, we believe, to their success. Um, and finally, which you'll love this slide, is, you can steal it, I'll let you have it, is uh, reentry matters. I mean, it, this is what you guys are doing is key to our work. Um, you know, it's public safety, it's making stronger communities, um, it's, it's, it's uh, improving the well-being of communities because they're making it safer. Um, and it's smarter use of taxpayer dollars. Um, if we can keep people from cycling in, we can re use those, those, that money somewhere else in terms of education or other types of things, those social services and things like that. So I'll say here to all of you that it's critically important to me and to my administration that we make sure people have good reentry plans when they get out and they get to those services that, that they need. Because we do want people to be successful. We do want people to have second chances. And we want the people that leave our prisons to be safe and to be productive members of their society. So last slide, I think. Oh, no, that was my last slide. So um, I thought everyone were in there. Um, anyway, um, I really appreciate your time and your commitment to reentry. Uh, we can't do this without you guys. So thank you so much for your time tonight. Um, I'll stick around maybe towards the back if anyone has any questions for me, but thank you again for your time and all your support uh, in reentry. Appreciate it. <laughs> Might want to sanitize this a little bit. <laughs> Thank you so much, Director Skinner. Now, I'm gonna welcome up to the stage Rich Mathias, who is uh, our new case manager here at Inside Out. So if you want to come up. He's gonna introduce our next speaker. Yeah, give it up for Rich. Hello, I'm Rich Mathias. Um, as she said, I'm also a, a formerly incarcerated individual. So, um, a returning citizen, what we like to say. This gentleman that I'm gonna um, introduce, his name's Sean Pika. He's the executive director of the Hudson League for Higher Education in Prison. 
a not-for-profit organiza organization that provides college education, life skills, and reentry support to incarcerated and formerly incarcerated men and women to help them make a positive impact on their lives, their families, their communities. Since taking over leadership of the organization in 2007, Hudson Lake has grown from 60 students attending Mercy College in Sing Sing Correctional Facility to more than 600 students. Enrolled annually in college prep preparatory and college programs in five New York State correctional facilities. Hudson Leak has been, has awarded more than 700 college degrees. In addition, Hudson Leak is now actively involved in the very important work of providing reentry support, including providing transitional housing to its more than 850 released alumni to help them successfully transition back into their families and communities. Under Mr. Pika's leadership, Hudson Link has been featured in several documentaries, including HBO's University of Sing Sing, PBS First Degree, and Moxie Pictures Zero Percent. Please give a warm welcome to Mr. Sean Pika. I had a whole speech prepared, but all I could think of is not to lick the microphone. Dr. Skinner, thank you. <laughs> wow, I don't even know where to begin. I know it's a terrible intro. When I was 16 years old, I was sentenced to 24 years in prison. Uh, I, I entered that first maximum security prison and I just thought my life was over. In New York, they were still sentencing teenagers as adults. If you were 16, you were sentenced as an adult. So when I walked into that first prison, they gave you a time computation sheet. So they take everything you own, they shave your head, they douse you with uh, uh, this disinfectant powder, and they hand you this sheet. And it's a carbon copy. They keep the one sheet. I guess they'll forget how long you're supposed to be there. And come well, on, that was a prison joke. And, um, <laughs> and I remember sitting on that bunk in a uniform that didn't fit me, looking at the dates when I was eligible for release. And it was just so far away and seemed so insane that I could possibly even survive that. And I'm like, why would they give a teenager this sheet? This, is there anybody thinking about what that's gonna do to the person sitting on that bunk who's just lost everything? And while I sat there, I was literally two inches shorter, I weighed 118 pounds, I was in the ninth grade when I got arrested, and I still had braces on my teeth. Like, are you fucking kidding me? And I wasn't a prison joke. And, and then I'm listening to Dr. Skinner talk, who introduces herself as, as a social worker. Like, where were you 31 years ago? Well, I know what you were there, but like, isn't that, if I had had a conversation with that person on that day, how different my life would have been? I literally spent the first few years in and out of solitary confinement, just lost and adrift. I didn't care. I, what would I possibly try and better myself, look towards what future? And I, I wish I could stand before you now and say that I created Hudson Link and I went through college in that crazy place because I was a really great student and that I built this organization to where it is today because I'm such a smart guy. But the fact is, the older guys grabbed me. That came out all wrong. So <laughs> I, I appreciate your humor, prison humor in this. I got there and gave up and the older guys made sure I didn't. And the staff, the officers and the old timers really, I will start by saying they completely lied to me. They said that if I wanted to work with them in the mess hall, which was one of the better jobs, I needed to finish high school. I went for so long, it took me a few tries <laughs> just between us, and um, I finished high school and then somebody said, no, you didn't, you could have started the mess hall two months ago. <laughs> but it was really good because 
I would have never tried. But I will also say I heard something for the first time in my life. As someone that had bullshitted his com way completely through school, at the, in, in the ninth grade when they realized that I didn't know how to read and write, and they finally held me back a year, and that's the year I went to prison. I, I wasn't college material. Shit, I wasn't even high school material. And my mom and dad were New York City cops. I'm one of five boys. I'm the only one that went to prison, but I'm also the only one that went to college. And that only happened because those older guys said something to me. You don't have to do it yourself. We're going to help you. And <laughs> when I got that high school diploma, there should have been 20 people up on that stage with me. And there's a humbling piece to that, to knowing that you couldn't have done it alone. And also, again, the school administrator that lied to me. Because I said, well, but just put that thing in my file. I could start in the mess hall. No, 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 you have to come down to physically take it from me on the stage. Oh, she lied. That was, not, that was definitely not true. But when I got up on that stage, and the prison did a really good job of caps and gowns and cake. That might have been another motivating factor. <laughs> and when they handed me that, the realization that that was the first thing I finished in my life. Like, talk about letting down your family, your community, yourself, and then you have 24 years to think about it? Like, I was a bit confused. But in that moment, taking that scroll on that stage, I dared think for one second, that, well, oh, maybe I could try college. Maybe. I don't want to get too ambitious here. But again, the guys helped me, and they signed me up for pre-college. While attending pre-college, just figuring out some basic things about etiquette and, and being in a classroom and study skills and, and college is obviously way more than academic work, about life. As the students and the, and, and the other staff members really taught me and, and so much more than just college. And the other humbling piece that nobody looked like me. A block is the largest cell block in the country. It's two football fields long. When those gates crack and you step out on the gallery to go to the mess hall, the chapel, or the school, you're two football fields from the nearest officer and you're the only white guy out of 88 cells. When you make it to the mess hall, it's because other people cared about me and they didn't have to. When I got attested out of the pre-college and I was accepted into the college program, I got moved around quite a bit. I was in and out of solitary confinement. I didn't take direction well. I didn't take direction well <laughs> and I got moved. So normally in New York, if you go through the orientation process, you'll get assigned to a facility that meets your needs, and generally you'll stay in that facility for your whole time. I was in nine different prisons, nine different maximum security prisons during that, my time inside. And that's, that's the downside. The good side is that I went to a different college every time I got moved, because in the 80s, there were 350 programs like ours all across the country. So I went to some amazing universities, and I didn't even know what that meant at the time. But in 1994, when the crime bill slipped in the little piece of legislature that says you can have college, you just can't have the funding for it. And I, it was horrible, I know. That is not prison humor. And I, I was in the classroom when the college folks came in with empty file boxes and packed their materials and their books up and left. And all of a sudden, I, I remember seeing a joke handwritten on the wall that just said, um, until further notice, the light at the end of the tunnel has been diminished. And it was just like, for so many of us, we knew that maybe not college, but a trade or some time of schooling was going to be the only second chance, for some of us, the first chance we'd ever really have. So to take that away just seemed so insane. But I had 118 credits and no degree. And... I didn't really care because I kind of thought as a teenager, 
was college ever really going to help me? When I leave this place and I'm, how old am I going to be? Am I really going to show that resume to anyone? Who the fuck is going to hire me? When I walked out of Sing Sing, I had more time in prison than out of prison. I didn't weigh 118 pounds anymore. I was now 210 pounds, top 10 state powerlifter with tattoos all over my back and neck. And my head was shaved and I didn't present so well. I didn't know what my future looked like, but I just thought, How is that diploma going to possibly help me? But some of the old timers were not going to take no for an answer. And they started advocating to figure out how to create a college program without funding, without a college, without any resources. And we were getting together once a month in a dark, weird looking room in the basement of Sing Sing. And I was told I had to be there and I was coming, and I was told to sit in the back and shut up, and if they needed my thoughts, they'd ask for them. But these were the guys that took care of me and raised me, and if they wanted me there, I was gonna be there. And in one of those meetings, the warden came. Now, I had been in nine maximum security prisons by that point in my life. I had never met a warden before. There was no one wandering around, greeting the guys, seeing how things were going. So when I met him in that meeting, we all kind of said, what's he up to? Nothing. He just said openly and honestly, I don't know how to start a college program, but I do know one thing, that if it's one possible change that could make this prison a better place, a safer place for officers, staff, and the guys, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be school. Let's figure it out. And we started a prison college program right there. And at the time, I didn't realize there was a difference between prison college and college. And 18 months later, using some of the credits I already had and some of the credits I got there at Sing Sing, I got my bachelor's degree. And while I was at the graduation, again, the prison did an amazing job with an orchestra and outside guests and cakes. Gotta have the cakes. Just warden, just gotta have the cakes, FYI. And caps and gowns. And they, it, you felt like you were at a graduation. And my family came and they watched me finish this thing for the first time in my life. And we shared it together. And the commissioner and the warden and the president of New York Theological Seminary were, were walking around the graduation and they were thanking the families for coming up and seeing us do this thing. And I didn't know it, but there were 12 seats every year for a graduate program, the only graduate program in a maximum security prison in the state. And one of those students, because of a medical situation, wasn't able to start school. And the warden who knew me from my time with the maintenance department, I had interfaced with him a lot, said, Sean, classes start on Monday. Do you want to sit in that seat? I wish I could tell you that I jumped at the chance. I actually went into a whole big rhetoric about needing a little bit of time off. The, the students in the room know what I'm saying. I need to gather my thoughts a little bit, take some time to kind of think about what my next steps were going to be, <laughs> measure my future. And my mother turned past me and said to the commissioner, Monday? Yeah, what time should he be there? <laughs> I was still afraid of my mother at that point in my life, so I, I went down to the school really scared. Was I really going to do graduate work? The same guy that got failed in the ninth grade because I didn't know how to read and write? None of us wants to look like a dummy in that classroom. It was an intensive five day a week, 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. program. And in one year, I'd have my master's in professional studies, and you had to have an internship. And my internship from 3 p.m. to 9 p.m. was to work for Hudson Link, which I had just graduated from. And I would be the liaison with the warden's office and the next batch of students because the warden really wanted this to move out of this pilot phase. Let's get rid of that pilot phase. Let's just start a college program here at Sing Sing. And now all of a sudden, the skinny, nerdy, white guy with glasses that was living in A Block was in charge of the waiting list. 
Let me just show you how I walked down the cell block after that. <laughs> you know this? Maybe not quite as swaggerish as that, but to this day, folks remember the integrity that we have managed from that day on. You can't buy your way up that list. You can't threaten your way up that list, but you can try. The waiting list is two years long in that college program. It is the only degree-granting college program in a maximum security prison in the country that's run, staffed, and coordinated by formerly incarcerated people. Our development team, the management team, the director, every single site coordinator sat in those seats and now run it. It is run with integrity that is demanded by the students that sit in those seats. We began to expand. When I was offered the chance to be the director of the program, which, by the way, when I got out, I just wanted to stuff envelopes. I wanted to help out in any way possible for this program that really gave me a second chance at life. I had served 16 and a half years of the 24 years when I was released. I went to a local halfway house and it ended up being right by the office of the college program. There was a half a staff person and no money and a board of directors. And I just wanted to do anything I could. I ran errands, I stuffed envelopes, anything that could make it helpful. There was an event that the commissioner, the warden, and the college president came to for Hudson Link. At the event, they pulled me on the side. They said, hey, we're here, you're doing really well. I was back in grad school at that point. I was working on my social work degree with Hunter College. And the commissioner said, did the warden ask you about Sing Sing? I said, well, what do you mean? He said, no one knows where the paper clips are. I wish I could say they offered me the position because I was so smart. <laughs> he said, it would be really cool if you came back. <coughs> cool me like no one else wants the job cool or? <laughs> they had absolutely no money, but they also had no idea how to run it. And I said to the commissioner, I am hugely honored by the opportunity to be the director of this program, but I earned 18 cents an hour for physically half my life. And when I left Sing Sing, I had more time inside than outside. I need a raise. Let's talk about some negotiating right here. <laughs> they did. And we took it from that one site with that one college program with about 66 students. And we're now 10 years later in five different prisons nine college partners, a two and a half million dollar budget that we don't get any state or federal funding for. I raise every single penny privately. We have 654 students working on pre-college, remedial, two-year and four-year programming. We now have men and women in the program. We have four award-winning documentaries and we launched a construction initiative about a year ago. Just between us, the first year has been disastrous. I need to edit that from the film. <laughs> Warren and Doris Buffett gifted us a headquarters building about two years ago. For a small nonprofit, having a space that you, no mortgage, no rent, no taxes, just the sustainability of it was a big deal. And when we were moving, all the alumni came and chipped in that were home and moved boxes. And we found a file box with the original 16 students' research projects. We had to do a capstone to graduate. And my capstone was a project to take dilapidated homes in impoverished communities and use our students to rehab them in an effort to flip them and make money for the program. So when they found that box and tried to throw it away, I said, hold on, my, my paper might be in there. I had totally forgotten about what I had written. And I went to the back page and I crossed off flip and wrote in create transitional housing. We now just opened the doors of the first project, five beds for men, and we just broke ground on the second project, which would be nine beds for women. <laughs> Two other funders have offered me houses in the past 24 hours. I kinda had to pump the brakes a little bit. I swore to our board of directors that I would not be on the construction sites, that I would hire another alumni to manage the sites, Unfortunately, we've been filming the projects, 
and they've been seen. So they know I've been there every single day. I'm in every single picture. <laughs> I would give up this suit in a second and spackle all day long if possible. But I know that there are other things that have to happen first. And being at the helm of this organization, as someone that went through it, not just doing this work in New York, but also helping other states grow and replicate and do this work. We're currently helping North Carolina and Tennessee. Um, people keep saying to me, you need to take that playbook and sell it to North Carolina and Tennessee. But the fact is the folks here in this room that are doing this incredible work are the folks that don't have any money. So I'm not selling anything. I'm traveling the country, usually sleeping on someone's couch. So Heather got me a room. I was so happy to be in a hotel. <laughs> because this work given to the folks that are in the trenches with us doing it, have to get it the same way we got it. And that's just the coolest moment of this job, to be able to do it and spread it and help other people get it as well. I've been just honored to be an ambassador um, and, and not make 18 cents an hour anymore. <laughs> I just thought I would talk a little bit about the program and where we are and my story, and then maybe open up to Q&A if you guys wanted to do that as well. Questions? Thoughts? Com what about accreditation? Are you going to deal with that at all? Or? The professor in the, in the audience. I will just say that no one ever asked that because, and I'm saying this out of the utmost respect, for 20 years, we're, we're at the 25th anniversary of the uh, Pell being taken away, there were folks that just dove into those prisons to do something, teach poetry, entrepreneurial classes, whatever, because it was better than nothing at all, but folks started calling that college. And many of the inmates in the program said, no, nah, mom, I'm going to college. A transcript. What, what do you mean a transcript? And they, nobody was telling them that they weren't a and, and And I would just say, as someone that jumped into those programs, tons of amazing, great stuff I got. But it wasn't college. This is degree-granting, accredited uh, college work that, it, that has to go through middle stage, which is in New York, uh, the, the accounting body, um, to, sh to show that it's a real, the real deal. Transcripts from the campuses. We have Columbia University, Mercy College, Vassar, St. Tom, like just incredible schools, but also recently started partnering with some CUNY schools, the local, local small schools that don't have the resources that Columbia does. Been amazing partnerships. Um, the professors are incredible. They get our students and just trying to mix it up, private, state institutions. Um, but every single, now the, the tricky part is we just launched a new program in Shawanagunk, which is uh, the most secure prison in New York State. Um, you can't get middle states to a site for about 18 months. So you launch a program, get through all the DOCCS red tape, pick the students, start the classes, and by the time you get into your second semester, about a year's worth of work, then it gets accredited. Now all those credits are good, but what if it doesn't pass accreditation? Who's gonna tell those students, because I was bullshitting that whole year, I'm not telling them it might get accredited. And you just gotta hope. Now so far, every single one has been accredited and passed, and the accrediting body said this is so much better than what's happening on the traditional campuses. The fact that these students are not on laptops and on their phones, and uh, it's just been incredible. We have professors that are, all adjunct professors that are coming from the campuses that say, I'd rather just not teach on the traditional campus at all anymore. It's just such a pleasure to teach in these prison campuses, but just really trying to have, I, I know uh, Mary Gould from the Alliance for Higher Education is coming next week to talk at the prison um, with a report that just came out about excellence and equity. These programs are real, and they all have to start to be held to that same accountability if we want folks like me to get out of prison, go to another campus, and not look dumb in that classroom. At the end of my two-year full-time programming with Hunter to get my MSW, the president of the college asked me to keep, be the keynote speaker at my own graduation. That's real. I'm currently doing an MBA program. I'm six classes in on the 13... Uh, class program. Somebody told me once that I was not college material and I agreed with them. But maybe I just learned a little differently. Maybe all of our students in these programs learned a little differently and we're now teaching to their strengths, not the other way around. What is the process for selecting students for these programs? All my friends obviously get in. <laughs> 
I, I will joke that the, uh, the downside of growing up in nine maximum security prisons is you grew up in nine maximum security. The upside is all my friends are now the wardens. So I will literally, you have to include the DOCCS. And I think a lot of these conversations for a long time, the Department of Corrections reached our space. We raised the money. We'll meet you in the middle or not. If the Department of Corrections is not at the table for these conversations about every bit of it, then we've already lost. And the wardens take my list of who has, I mean, you have to be uh, uh, the same way you would go on a campus. You have to have a high school diploma or a GED, and you have to be one year disciplinary free at the facility. Now that's my caveat back to the Department of Corrections, because the fact is these prisons that have any kind of educational programs, let alone college, have lower rates of violence and disciplinary infractions. So I don't have to be led into a prison to run a college program, but it sure helps if the facility wants you there. And the union in New York has been our biggest supporter, the commissioner, I, I just been involved with so many of the conversations, but all of the other requirements, the same professors, the same textbooks, um, the same testing, is exactly as what would be, even the schedules that would be on campus, you just need a high school diploma. And be my friend. <laughs> uh, oh, I'm sorry. Little nonprofit here in Iowa City, um, focusing on the entry. Um, for people who would be coming out of incarceration with education, with maybe with a degree, are there particular needs that they would have when they're re entering society? Or would there be particular gifts that they might be able to use to aid other people? I would just say when Dr. Skinner talked about treatment and treatment plans, I, I tried not to amen from the back of the room. I had a big conversation last Friday with our board of directors and our staff because in my world, I survive every single day on grants and foundations and the local community supporting this work, but there's a big problem with substance abuse inside the prison and out, and we're not talking about it. We're not going to, I, I don't want to say, we're not going to fix, and I'm not trying to fix anybody, but we're not going to start to address these issues as a community until we start to talk about it. And I think that as we open our own housing situation, we're in for uh, a, a little bit of a mountain, and we're going to have to go up that mountain uh, probably one client at a time. But we're going to figure it out, and we're going to, treat each person as a person, not as a formerly incarcerated person. And I, I mean, I wish I could tell you more than that. I, I don't have no idea how it's gonna go. We've never done this before. Um, and I know with my own battles with addiction, it, it is very real. Have any of your graduates gone on to a reassignment? Yes. Why would you ask that in front of everybody? Um, I'm just kidding. I, I, I want to start by saying recidivism has no role at all in my work. I don't do any of this work in any way because I'm worried about somebody recidivating. Dear friends of mine that I've loved and was raised by have gone back to prison. No rhyme or reason to the work. We've had 17 people in 21 years go back. I think it's a little less than 2% recidivism rate, but the numbers are, aren't gigantic. I think we've had 1,100 students um, in 21 years, uh, 700 degrees. It's three different bodies of students. 659 are currently enrolled in prisons. 300 have gone through the program and not been released. And I think it's 1,100 or 1,200 have gone through the program in our home. So uh, we track every single one and keep up to date, mostly because we're just concerned about their well being. Um, but everybody wants to know those numbers, so we track them as well. Uh, we, we got a gift of Salesforce as a new database about a year ago. They might as well have given us a bag of rocks. It is the most complicated thing I have ever seen. Thankfully, I am not the brains behind the operation, but our team has been just in it. You should, it's not funny, <laughs> but, they're, <laughs> but they're figuring it out. But we thought we had 900 students home and now we're finding out it's more like 1,200, which is not a big difference, but, well, where are those other few hundred students? You know, so really trying, and we've had a large amount of students, probably about 11% deported. But we've also tracked them through things like Facebook and stuff, so um, many of them are in DR, uh, 
uh, Korea, Trinidad, um, and Jamaica. And to see them doing amazing things is just really cool that it's gone, that education has gone beyond New York. Um, I don't really talk about the deportation much because quite frankly it pisses people off that they've invested in a New York thing as New Yorkers and now those folks aren't in New York. So we'll just keep that between us. <laughs> you had enough of me already? Welcome home. And it's like, with a two decade old felony, you know what I'm saying, I can't get a place. You know what I'm saying? My sister and my brother in law took me into their home, you know what I'm saying? But I found out that it's like, you know, it's like climbing, you know what I'm saying? Now I'm never. Yeah. I'm just getting a chance. Give me a chance. You know what I'm saying? I, I never, I lived in Iowa City 18 years. I never got evicted from a place, uh, nothing. But I can't get in a place. The, the fact that so many of the employment, college, and residential applications have a box to be checked if you're formerly incarcerated uh, is just super scary because the fact is they don't, they don't call you if you check the box. You can't even get through the door. Welcome home. They do. Yeah, so we implemented, when I was still in the program, um, a $10 semester fee, which is the spring, summer, fall, so it's $30 a year. And I know that sounds insultingly low, but when you make 18 cents an hour, my, I had one of the highest paying jobs in the maintenance department at Sing Sing. I made $15.75 every other week. So to make the commitment to not just stay disciplinary free, do the college work. If your GPA dropped below a certain amount, you're out of the program. And pay that semester fee, um, it, it's a big deal. But also, I've seen some of these guys just don't have it. And I've seen this sense of community where there's no secrets in that place. And if I know you're having a tough time, how do we chip in and keep you going? And it's a big deal. I feel like, I hope there's no college providers in the room, college is the smallest part of this college program. There's so many other really important community builders and just things about life that you learn while you're in school that nobody told me. I didn't know anybody that had been to college before. I didn't even get that there was other things happening. And that's what these students are going through. And I've never, I've been the director 10, 11 years, I have never heard a student complain about that $10 fee. another professor in the audience. So we offer um, an AA in liberal arts, an AA in behavioral science, uh, a BA in behavioral science, and a BA in organizational management. We've kind of kept it tight because quite frankly, at the undergrad level, it, it doesn't pay to start individualizing the programs. It costs so much money to start doing more and more courses. Um, and delivering a lot of the colleges these days have online components. So to find a two-year or four-year program that doesn't have mandatory online components, because we do have computer labs, but there's no internet. So it's been really tricky to deliver a, a, a real college program and not need the, uh, the internet to do it. It is also a little unfair to call it reentry. I mean, I was in the ninth grade. I was a teenager. I was living in my mother's basement. And am I really reentering the community? I didn't even know what it was. So I think for a lot of our community members, not only did they not know what reentry means, the last time they were there, they were, they were hurting people. I don't care what your crime is. You left because you were hurting somebody. So we have to accept that. 
uh, I, I, at no part of this work do I want to start to forget about what brought me to prison. I damaged and hurt people and, and hurt the community. I need to build on that and look forward and never forget the, the really dumb things I did as a teenager. On the same token, we're returning to these communities as helpers now. And that helping profession, 86% of our students have become caseworkers, social workers, or counselors, and 34% have gone on to graduate work. So we're now an asset back in the communities, and that's the piece we want to concentrate on. Um, it, and I didn't mean that as a criticism. Oh, no, 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 none taken. We did, and, and I think as of this year, we're more of a reentry looking program than an in-college prison program because the numbers have now shifted where we have more people outside than inside as of this year. And the housing component, the single biggest indicated to a successful reentry is safe, affordable housing. So our idea of having these five beds in this brand new home run and managed by formerly incarcerated people free should hopefully be a big indicator for success. Um, and if we do one project a year, we'll have 50 or 60 beds before you know it. I don't know, though. I mean, I, I could be completely wrong. Um, and I think that we, we did hire a face-to-face -face alumni coordinator. Um, and what she does is she deals with every single person as you're preparing for release and talks with you inside the prison. So there's a familiar face on the outside of the prison. We have a four-part plan right now. In New York, we're spoiled because there's so many really large reentry organizations that are doing incredible things, but most of them don't work with an educated population. So they're doing great things, but they can't really help us. So what they end up doing is, since most of us are mandated through parole to take these programs, they just hire us, and we end up running programs. That's how I got into the field. <laughs> so um, that's great. It works. But who's serving us? So what we've started doing is business attire for all the men and women that come home. Um, we just collect uh, gently used business attire. We have agencies that donate brand new stuff to us. And also, um, we give a laptop to every student coming home since so many go on to school, either to finish or grad work. A laptop's really helpful. And um, housing, and then every other month, networking dinner. That's a fancy way of saying we have pizza every other month. But <laughs> if 86% of our students are in the same field, you're leaving that room with a job, if you want it. What impact does uh, participation in the program have on inmates at the parole board? Wow. Uh, I think New York in general, I went to the parole board five times. I received 24 months each time while I was in college. So I think it was an era of nobody cared, not college being the employee. So I think now, with the governor that like is visiting the prison and coming, I mean, it's just been an incredible couple of years with the new governor. It, college is certainly an indicator, but I just think that he's thinking differently about criminal justice. And there, he has a reentry task force, and there's actually four seats on his task force for formerly incarcerated people, and I'm one of them. So he's invited us to the table to work on policy for incarcerated and, and formerly incarcerated folks, which has been a really big deal. I, for me, I don't know. It felt like a really big deal. Have you had to deal with state licensing requirements and stuff for people to be case managers or counselors? I don't think New York really needs it. I have my master's in social work, and I never got licensed. Okay. Yeah. You, I, think it, I think the only reason to get licensed is if you want to open your own practice. So working for like a Hudson Inc. or four, I worked for four agencies. Actually, one of them was for parole. I was doing substance abuse counseling for newly released state and federal prisoners. I was actually administering the interaction between parole while I was on parole. And in a crazy way, they liked that. Like, all right, you know the system. These guys can't bullshit you. And I was in control. And it was kind of the weirdest moment doing your analysis testing and substance abuse testing and all the stuff for folks that I knew on the inside. But there was no other licensing that I needed. Guys, thank you so much, and I really appreciate being invited.